Okay, welcome to come into the latest edition of the Grittiest Take as we are here joined by Pirlo Wisdom today as we are going to discuss some of the NHL playoffs and especially our Flyers and Capitals matchup tomorrow at 4 o'clock. I hope a lot of you are able to rush home from work to see that, but uh, how you doing today? Oh, I'm doing fantastic. Uh, not too bit much of a fan of the results of the first game of the day, but besides that, it's still all right. Still going good. Uh, yeah, doing doing well, man. Thanks. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I know you pick stuff for your uh, cappers and stuff, but I uh, it 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 was nice. I I did almost debate putting a little bit on Florida because I thought they would fight to win their first playoff game in four years to probably get one, and then I didn't do that, so I kind of regret that now. But uh, the point being is, it's nice kind of seeing a team that everybody goes no one cares about, like has those reactions to all the time, finally get their first playoff when play a great game like they did uh, under Quinville, where you saw for the first time since really with the Blackhawks in the playoffs, Quinville like doing that pump up Raha stuff on the bench. Like it was kind of nice to see that also not on the Blackhawks, but it was nice to see that for the Panthers for one game in the series because they haven't won since 2016. But uh, I don't think they're going to – I don't know how much they're going to do past that, but it was nice to see them get the one uh, win because they they were fairly even today. I mean, the Panthers beat them in faceoffs, like I said, which is an important thing. They also beat them in power plays 2-5, to five, which was a huge factor. The Islanders were 0 for 3. But they were both even in shots and basically even in blocks. It was 15 or 14-13 to 13, and even in giveaways basically at 11 and 10 and seven and seven. So the power play is really what was the deciding factor of this game. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, I was just going to say the Islanders looked jittery. And I think that contributed to the, because the Islanders don't generally take penalties. They look jittery right from the beginning. Uh, They had obviously the pressure on them. They want to get this over, get, get done, win this game. It was big for them. And uh, I think that contributed to some of the power plays. Like, for instance, when Verlamov played the puck outside of the trapezoid, that yes. was that was terrible. And then they couldn't – once they couldn't defend that PK, uh, it, it, it took the wind out of my sails, <laughs> let alone – I can just imagine them. So, uh, yeah, it was that, – that was pretty much, I agree, the, the, the whole I, – I watched the game. The Islanders played not bad. They played their game. It's just, like you said, the power plays. You can't give Florida power plays. They've got too many high-percentage shooters on that side. Exactly. That's the big deciding factor in that game. That's why I wanted to go to that. But I think uh, we are seeing now a reminiscent of the Carey Price game one game going on, if anybody's watching uh, the Arizona and Nashville game, where Price made all these saves, and then, long and behold, the Canadians scored. Kemper so far in this game has made all these saves. And then, long and behold, the Coyotes score when Nashville's heftily outplaying them otherwise. Wow. So, uh, what do you think of some of these games where the goalie's just setting the table for the mm-hmm. momentum and then his team gets the goal? And then maybe for Arizona, it'll balance out like it did for the Canadians a little bit, they hope. Because in the end, when you looked at those stats, that game did balance out more. What do you think uh-huh. about it? I think yeah, it, Pittsburgh started playing a little more defensively and allowing a few more shots later on. But uh, for the most part, Pittsburgh has defeated, has outplayed them both games. What do I think about them being outshot and being outplayed and stuff like that? You're talking about, you know, in Price and Kemper, two of the best goaltenders of our time. So uh, that's the reason why I took Arizona to win. However, I thought Arizona would play better than this. Rick Talk is a great coach. If Arizona keeps on playing like this, I don't think Talk is going to lose his job. I think players are going to lose their jobs and they're going to redo things differently next year. Now that Shake is out, especially, uh, we'll see. Uh, we'll see a whole. We'll see a whole new structure. I think yeah. to the Arizona. It's also team. funny. Uh, Steve Sullivan, um, their new GM, was a big player for the current team they're trying to beat. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He was he was a big time player for. Uh, he's just got all of a sudden promoted. And it's like, oh, by the way, guess who you're playing? Nashville. Yeah. 
It's like, oh, that's convenient. <laughs> so that, I, play, just, I just found it. Toronto, Nashville, and I, I want to say Chicago. I think Chicago was the other team, yeah. But yeah. I just found it hilarious that it ended up just falling in the place that he got promoted. And it's like, oh, we'll play in Nashville. It's like, oh, look at that. <laughs> he was an underrated little player, too. He was a yeah. good little player. No, I yeah, he's somebody that not everybody remember. Someone that not everybody remember either was when I was watching NHL um, TV. I saw we'll get to this team uh, later as we cover them as the first team before we get to our game at four for tomorrow. Um, but Ryan Carter is on the post game coverage of the Wild. I'm like, damn, I haven't heard that name in years. Uh, and, and he actually was a decent post game man. I was like, I haven't heard of I haven't seen or heard of Ryan Carter in years. And I was like. Oh, good to see he's still doing well. Um, but uh, that was just something from yesterday. But we now have the next game on the docket today. That'll be pretty much as soon as this comes out is the Lightning and Bruins. The Bruins, of course, lost to the Flyers in the first game. And the Lightning, of course, won a hard fought game that went to a shootout, which technically became the first playoff shootout um, for um, against the uh, Capitals, rather, with a nice goal by Nikita Kucherov, which some people said the rules should change, that if you get a penalty at the end of the game, you shouldn't be allowed to shoot in the shootout. But he was allowed to shoot in the shootout, and he scored. So, the Lightning won. So, yeah. what do you think of, what do you think of uh, that series, and do you think that's a good rule or they should actually change that? Because I'm just curious what your take is right now. Um, I don't think they should change that. No, just whatever. It's like... If there's any time that I get, uh, I, that I maybe get on the negative side of the game, I still can't stand the shootouts. Um, but the thing is, I don't, other people love them, so I want it to stay. You know what I mean? Because there's a lot of people that love it and it's good for the game, but I can't watch them work shit. So you can do whatever you want with the shootout. I couldn't care less. You want to change that penalty? Go ahead. Well, what are you going to do? So you lose right away? There's no shootout? That's not going to happen. Because the whole thing is the exciting part of shootout is what keeps the average fan happy about the game, right? And that's good. I'm glad they do that. I'm glad. If that's going to keep the average fan happy and fill the seats, that's awesome. But myself, I guess, I watch them and I go, uh, oh, really? <laughs> uh, occasionally it's exciting, I suppose. But then afterwards, I, I'm trying to think of something. You ever do something where it's, while you're watching it, it's exciting, and then afterwards you feel kind of filthy afterwards. That's <laughs> that's what I feel like about shootouts. Like, eh, it didn't really do anything. But, uh, yeah. So, but the series, what, Tampa Bay-Boston, the game, you mean? What do I think of that game? Or what's yeah. happening? Uh, I think this, I think these series is, these these uh, should matter more than they are. I, I, I'm surprised people are taking it lightly. I think seeding is more important than people are saying. Um, and there's some teams that I think are taking it seriously, a little more seriously than others, and that's a good thing. Um, I don't know who's going to win this because of that. I'm not sure. I don't really want to put a lean on it, but with the game itself, I, I will say this, though. It, it appears the Bruins don't seem right. Yeah, because everyone I – would, I would have to say uh, it has to do with the fact that I would think Everyone came back late. Not everybody, but you got Marshawn came in and was healthy late, so he played basically not in hockey shape yet. And then when Kase's able to get in, he won't be in hockey shape yet because he's going to have to get a couple games on his belt because he had no exhibition. He had none of the, all, all the run-throughs. So I think they're just kind of at a disadvantage because of what happened to them uh, with the health and all that. I, I think it's kind of def a little bit deflating, too, that you fought so hard in the regular season to get that not top seed, and now you're playing in something like this, to, and and they already lost the game. Uh, I think that might be a little bit deflating in the room. Uh, what was I going to say? Tampa, Bo Tampa, did I hear Stamkos might be coming back, too? Um, I'm not sure if that's for today. Okay. Sure. I guess I, I never thought about that when we before we did the video, but ruled out for the round robin. He's not playing tonight. Yeah, I didn't think. But he okay. but he could be coming back soon. So 
that'll be good for them. Yeah, no, I agree. I think the big thing here is you're facing teams. You're facing one team that's first in scoring to another team that's still top 10. So you're going to see it's just going to be a game. And then both of and then you have against the Bruins team. That's the best at defense. So how's the top offense in the East going to do against the best defense in the East? And then how is the ninth ranked offense in the East, which is the Bruins going to do against the 17th ranked defense, which is the lightning. So, like, all those matchups play in because they have two Vezina goalies. So, the, the goalies are probably going to play well, and you're going to have to win somewhere within those other per- parameters. So, that's probably what's going to play in this game, I would say. With the game itself, yeah. I mean, if this was a series against each other, it would be one barn burner, right? Oh, I yeah. Would, I would probably lean to Tampa Bay. You're uh, – you, when we were talking about series and who's going to win the cup and all that stuff like that, you kind of, you kind of brought up some really good points that got my mind kind of leaning maybe to Tampa Bay to win the cup too. Uh, so uh, because I mean the Sorellis of the world and that Sergachev kid, if, yeah, that having a duel like Sergachev and Hedman on a team, is, yeah, that is a rarity to have those that kind of talent on your top two. Uh, you think of Niedermeyer Pronger uh, comes right to the top of my head. Like that was one incredible combination uh, pairing. Uh, so the and uh, teams that have those combinations generally find a way to win a cup, at least one. No, I completely agree. That's a very good point. I completely agree with that. But our next one we'll go into real quick is between the Dallas Stars and Colorado Avalanche. The Avalanche, of course, looked good in their first game where the Stars looked, eh, they looked, they lost five to three against Vegas and just did not look all too hot where the Avalanche played a very close game against the St. Louis Blues and scored one of the most exciting finishes I've ever seen with literally 0.1 second left to end the game um so that's going to be a very fun game to watch tonight or not tonight that no that is tonight that's at 6 30 here and then it'll be 4 30 um in the two hour time zones pacific and then it'll be um in the central for people that are one hour back it'll be 5 30 so um what do you think of colorado and dallas because dallas looked shaky in their first game colorado and St. Louis both looked fairly decent and played each other close, and then Colorado got that ending goal there. Um, I don't know about this game, but again, because round robin, it's yeah. difficult to predict. I do have a play on it, but um, I do know that I would really like to see, especially in the Dallas Stars, when you have it, when we have a team like da- Dallas or the Islanders or Columbus, there's no such thing as well, we'll just see, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll put things together, get our passes together for the seeding rounds. So we're in sync and blah, blah, blah. They don't play those type of games. You know, if Dallas and the Islanders and Columbus are going to beat you, it's going to be aggressiveness and uh, good defensive play and intensity. Uh, a good example of that was Columbus yesterday had none of those. It was terrible. They played scared. Yeah. And if you're uh, to me, I would really like to see uh, Dallas playing with more intensity in these rounds. I'm a little concerned for them uh, going into the final, going into the next round, uh, into the playoffs. I mean, whoever they play against in the seeding round, uh, because I'm not happy with a team that is built like this, playing like that. A team like maybe Colorado or Tampa Bay, I can see them getting away with that. They're more skilled. They're playing more speed game. They got. They're trying to work on their uh, pa- uh, long passes and uh, positioning and offensive positioning and wh- who's going to work play with who, and just getting in the group. But guys, teams like Dallas, you can't just turn it on. No, I agree. Yeah, they should play, but it doesn't make their defense and goaltender who didn't play terribly overall look good Played when well. you have your defense. Uh, play horrific in the first game of the 
So, yeah, they need to uh, bounce back. But our next game before we go into the game – well, no, our next game would actually be Pittsburgh-Montreal before we go into the one, which is your other team, Pirlo Edmonton. Uh, Pittsburgh and Montreal is tied 1-1 because Carey Price – stood on his head in game one, and then Montreal slowly balanced out a little bit. And then game two, honestly, if Pittsburgh didn't score an extra goal, they probably, I said this in your podcast, I think Montreal probably would have been, because of how good Carey Price was doing, figured out a way to win that in overtime. Because he probably would have, plus you play five on five overtime, so you're not playing any of that three on three stuff. So he would have found a way to keep making the regular 5-on-5 save. And then just like they did, somehow, they found a way to get that one shot that worked, and then it went in. So I feel like that would have even happened, even though Pittsburgh got outplayed. Um, Or Pittsburgh outplayed them, I mean. That's why this series is so surprising, because... Pittsburgh doesn't scare me as much like we talked about in your podcast from this series because they're, they're playing Montreal. But, yeah, Carey Price is a great goalie and standing on his head. But if you're allowing Price with no defense to already stand on his head, imagine a team that has some defense that also has a great goalie. That's, the, that's like what you're thinking ahead. Yeah, it seems like the, they've had this problem on and off, more on than off for like two years. Not being able to score has been an issue for Pittsburgh for about two years now. Uh, they thought it was offensive depth. Um, I'm, I can't put my finger on it, to tell you the honest truth. Uh, maybe you watch Pittsburgh more than I do. Um, the only thing I can think of uh, is that they could be more creative. I think Pittsburgh has a team that can be more creative than they are. And uh, they are it, it, like when I watched that Montreal game, it seems like Price had them figured out. And uh, Pittsburgh seems to have one way they're going to play, and there's not much adjustment to that, which is weird because I mean Sullivan was going to be up for should have been up for Coach of the Year this year because of how well they did, um, as uh, because of how well they did with their injuries. But even with or without their injuries, the past two years. They've gone through quite a few long spells of not being able to score. Uh, or do you, have you noticed that as well? No, yeah, it's an odd, it's an oddity for them because they have a lineup that you would say, oh, somebody should be able to. Because then you have guys like Rust who have stepped up in past years when everybody that you think would be scoring is supposed to be scoring, and then all of a sudden Brian Rust is like, oh, don't worry, boys, I got this, and you're just like, where the hell did that come? Um, like, like they've had guys like that most years because somebody falls back a bit and then all of a sudden somebody else is just like, I got this. And then there's always that guy every year that steps up for Pittsburgh that usually balances it out. But I agree. Usually they don't have as much of a uh, goal streak as you would think they would have of continuously putting back back to back games of good, efficient scoring. That's not which is a team on paper you think would be consistent with it. So I completely yeah. agree with that. Yeah, it but, just doesn't look like they're creating as much as you would see it with a lot like Malkin and Gunzel and Crosby and Rust. I always liked Rust. I thought Rust could was more had more skill in him than given credit and he showed to that he did. Um uh it just that and maybe that's just to do with the fact that they're trying to be a lunch bucket team, but I would like to see some more creativity out of their lineup in a lot of a lot of times. And I think it hurts them. I think it hurts them that that, that creativity is not there a lot. And maybe they're afraid to. Uh, you get or you just get in a, a rut. You know, you just get a, a, you get in a rut, and it seems like they do get in those ruts sometimes. And I can't put my finger on as to why. But Montreal, almost like you said, has been able to take these games. I think a lot of it had to do with Price seemed to be yeah. able to see what they were doing before they did it. No, that's exactly. Price is on his game, and it's going to be interesting to see what happens tonight because if he's on his game again and it's more reminiscent of game one, it'll be interesting to see if Pittsburgh's able to figure it out. Um, but 
our last game on the docket for tonight is the nightcap of the Oilers versus Blackhawks, which has been a very good series so far. And when you look at these teams, which I didn't realize before looking at some of the interstats, how even actually from the regular season statistically some of this is, other than shots on goal allowed, Edmonton significantly better than shot. Well, not numbers-wise, but rank-wise, they're 20th. Chicago's 21st, but that's separated by 32 to 35 point one. So that's 3.1 shots. Um, but goals allowed, you guys are 15th with Edmonton, and the Blackhawks are 16th. The Oilers are 14th in offense. The Blackhawks are 18th, so that's a 4 with a 3.14 goals to a 2.97. So how close these teams were going in actually surprised me because Chicago was a team that was on the outs. But then when I really looked at their team, it didn't surprise me as much because I guess it's just at different times they were streaky. Like guys like Strone stepped up more at one time than someone like um, another youngster like Kajula or somebody else uh, when he was not injured. Schmolk stepped up like somebody – they just had all these different guys during the regular season come up at different times, just never at once, where obviously you guys had Yamamoto, McDavid, and Dreisaitl, and then uh, you had also Nuge. That kind of leads the force there. So it's, it's so. what do you feel about that series? Because those by the numbers, it's actually a pretty close series. I remember Andrew bringing that up on the one podcast, too. I think it's kind of like Florida – uh, in a sense, except with bigger, with more scorers. The, I think in these type of series, is uh, Edmonton with most teams, actually, the numbers are probably going to look similar. It's just they have high percentage shooters, especially with McDavid. I mean, I don't know. What's oh. your shooting percentage? It's just ridiculous. Uh, and Dreisaitl, uh, Yamamoto coming in with has, has definitely been huge. Another high percentage shooter. You have these high percentage shooters and um, Tippett. Um, I, I, I think it was, uh, how do I, extend? I think Tippett was almost overconfident in putting Smith in because he believed if, even if they lost that game, the loyalty he showed would be enough to get them over the top. Maybe the guy's a genius coach. So who am I to say, but uh, the, uh, the numbers are probably going to look the same, but Tippett's not afraid of it because he knows he has these high percentage shooters. So he's going to percentage shoot out the other team. And they'll, they'll, they'll give up probably more shots, uh, uh, equal amount of shots, how do a lot of things that seem similar, but just outclass their opponent. And that's the reason why I think the numbers look similar. Uh, Chicago's defense, though, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, you wanted, yeah, you wanted McDavid's SH percentage, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah, because I, I just I just found it. If you uh, it's a sixteen on the dot, it's a sixty percentage. It's pretty high. Yeah, it is pretty, pretty high. high. Because I looked at other guys, I was comparing it to some other guys before I got there, and other guys were closer to ten to 12. ten. Ten is about average. Yeah, 16 yeah like other guys high. were like eight to ten to twelve. Is, so that's a pretty high. Yeah. One. He's pretty high for the amount of shots he gets. It's pretty crazy, and uh, so he he's got that. But I'm a little concerned because. That Chicago defense is poor. Let's put it bluntly, it's poor. I, I, I really would be concerned with having numbers being equal in this sense because that number really is poor. I think, uh, but it had a lot to do with the first game and that they were out of sorts because Smith was put in that. I thought that was an awkward moment. And I don't think Tippett, I think Tippett, if you ask him in private, would have said, yeah, maybe I kind of got a little over loyal there. But if you're going to error, error on the side of anything, I suppose, error on the side of players feeling like you have their back. So Exactly, yeah. That's what yeah. I agree with. I just like how in the first game, I almost said Columbus, but uh, Chicago's vets looked real good. Then in the second, they didn't look as good, but then Kane looked better. But they weren't able to win. Where if that's able to balance out somewhere, that's why it's very interesting to watch these two teams offensively because the balance out there is obviously far greater than the balance out on defense. There's not a, you have, if Duncan Keith plays like he played in the first game, 
then there's more of a balance out on defense, but I don't see that happening the entire time. So that's uh, that's the problem there. But I agree, this is one of the more interesting series to follow, and that nightcap game is always one that I pay some of the most attention to because there's actually no other game on at that point where during all these other games, normally there might be at like the first blimp of the game, but other than that, there's no other game on at that point. All these other games, another game starts as the game's ending, so it's like... You're paying attention to two things at once sometimes. But um, tomorrow, we're just going to cover up until our game. So we're going to do the 2.30 is the Vancouver Canucks at, the, or not at, but the Minnesota Wild would be the team that now has the line change, the last change in this game. So who would be, who do you, well, first of all, this has been a very fun series to watch, in my opinion, one of the most fun to watch. What do you just think of this Forget, like, how do you think that matchup is tomorrow? Like, what do you think of the series as a whole? Because to me, it's been one of the more fun series to watch. Uh, yeah, as you know, I picked Minnesota to win this series, but I certainly was shaken by their uh, effort yesterday. Not that Minnesota had a poor effort, but they're, they're this that, talking about intensity, this is a team that's going to win in intensity, and Vancouver came out came out more intense yesterday in that game yesterday um i'm on i don't know i'm into i want to watch that game i want to see minnesota playing like they were the first game and at the end of that series and see what this turns into it's going to be a barn burner i really think if minnesota can keep that intensity keep that uh way they were playing before i mean kudos to vancouver though green is a fantastic young coach and he really did uh, put a system together that I think Minnesota's got to make an adjustment now. I oh, agree. Yeah. This series is got, there's a lot of psychological games. There's a lot of co- great coaching happening in here. I think a lot of people are not paying attention to the series much and they should be because this is what I think good old, good, intelligent hockey is all about. This is like chess hockey. And I, this is the kind of series I love to watch. Yeah, well, this series is also two coaches that are not the most – well, obviously, one's not. He got hired and then coached a little bit and then got hired to be their actual head coach in Dean Everson. And then Green is not very experienced in these moments in the playoffs in general yet. So you have two guys that are kind of adjusting on the fly um, doing it in this setting. So that's why it's very interesting to watch how good Green adjusted to game one. Now you get to see how good – Everson adjusts to game two, being yeah. a newer coach. So that'll be interesting to follow coming into tomorrow's matchup. But now to round out the podcast, we'll get into the Flyers or Philadelphia Flyers against the Washington Capitals and how we match up against them after we beat the, obviously, Bruins in the first game because, what well, one, two, was out that helped us a bit, but I think we still personally would have won just two to one or three to two if Tuke was in. That just would have been a hard fought game. It just wasn't after the first 10 minutes so hard fought with Yari. Um, but the Capitals and Flyers are also two teams that are very even. Obviously, the Flyers are right behind them. Uh, the Flyers are 41 21 and seven. The Caps are 41 20 and eight. So that's pretty much, like I said, pretty much even. The home record of the Flyers was significantly better than the Capitals at 25, 6, and 4, but the Capitals are way better on the road. But now that we're in neutral sites, everybody's reset. So the big thing in this game I look for is how Braden Holtby plays right away. Because if the Flyers are able to provide pressure and get everything on net like we are when we're going good, and I think we will be going good from the jump, because we got the momentum back from playing good later in the game. We just didn't start good, but we played good, obviously, to finish. Um, Other than, like, the last couple minutes, we kind of let Hart just save the puck for the last two minutes. But that, sometimes you just come back when you're up by a lot. But the Flyers played a great overall game. I think they're played pretty good in this game. Holpe, I think, is a big factor. If he comes in and struggles big time, to start the game and let's in one sloppy goal, like which was kind of a problem for him this year, then I think that's going to be a huge momentum grab for the Flyers. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I, I think they have the psychological edge against Washington. Is that that's kind of what you're saying, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think they the have the psychological edge the against football. Washington, and and the reason why, and I mentioned this when it happened, when A. B. put Elliott in, when he could have put in Carter against Washington that one game not long ago, uh, or in the regular season, I thought that was a brilliant move, because. Washington's goaltending is probably one of their biggest weaknesses, even if Sam Sonoff is in, because he's a kid. But with Holt, he has not had a great year. And putting Elliott in was like A.B. going, we can beat you with our backup. We'll beat you no matter what. This isn't as big a game as we think it is. I think he just got a psychological edge by doing that. And um, it's important. And you see that throughout the season with great coaches. They like they get psychological edges as much as they can against big opponents, and uh, that to me was a classic AB move, and I think it's going to be effective. And I think I believe Philadelphia is more driven to win this than Washington. Um, I, I and and I'm pretty sure are they put and they're are they putting Elliott in again? They probably will put in Moose because AB said he wants to put in Moose for a game. So I was just thinking it would make the most sense to do it against Washington. So I, <laughs> yeah, I would think I would think it would probably be the middle game because it also makes the most sense to let Hart finish since he's going to be the playoff starter. Yeah. So yeah. it makes the most sense to play Elliott in the middle, and it kind of just fell into place that it was against Washington rather than being Boston, Tampa, Washington. So not that Elliott couldn't have played Tampa. I think he could. I'm just saying. He stepped up against Washington, so you, that you it just fell into place having him play against a team he stepped up against. But yeah, and he and he's looking like a beast in this camp and in the exhibition. He's not even looking mm-hmm. like he, he's looking better than he was even in the regular season. So. He's he's looking the best I've ever uh, I've seen him since St. Louis. Yeah, exactly. So that's a huge uh, factor going in. And then the big things for this game, though. Obviously, as we know, the fl- the Flyers are a team that is one of the best in the face-off circle, and Washington is actually one of the worst. <laughs> so, um, there that's what hurt, in my opinion, probably started to hurt them as one of the best teams in hockey. Because eventually, if you're 28th in face-off, a team that stinks can just win a face-off against you, get one to pinball off of a couple people and then you're down with two minutes left <laughs> like that that's what happens if you're ranked 20 if you're ranked first in faceoffs, like the flyers normally that doesn't happen that much when you're playing detroit or somebody like that and it's somehow you're tied 3-3 and then all of a sudden because your team stinks at faceoffs, dylan larkin comes out and wins a faceoff against somebody and a pinballs off of six people <laughs> And then it goes in, and you're like, oh, well, this is unfortunate. Like, that's why having more than just Backstrom and guys like that that are good in the faceoff dot, that's what Washington really needs to hope they're able to do against the Flyers because the Flyers' first three lines, now first four lines with Thompson, destroy you in the faceoff dot because Thompson's one of the better faceoff people in the NHL. I think it's just overall uh... – you can get away with being poor in faceoffs if you have an overall possession game that allows you to do that. Uh, Washington, I found, has looked just off all year. They just haven't looked good all year, possession-wise. They have been surviving on big shots from Oshi and, uh, of course, Ovi. Um, and but overall, they just something is amiss in that Washington Capitals. Uh, uh, room or team or something. And I think it has to do it. I mean, it obviously tends to go towards coaching. It appears that it, they, 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 they just don't have the ability to adapt when needed. And like you said, for face-offs, face-offs are a lot of time are psychological. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a very psychological thing. And, and they, I agree. Jeru proved that the other day, he got kicked out for Couturier and he immediately thought, oh, I'm on my other hand. Let me flip my stick around and hold it like a lefty. And then he won a face-off like a lefty because he flipped his blade around and won it back 
that you're not going to – You most people can't think of that on the fly when their other player gets kicked out of the face-off dot. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, if, if, if a team is feeling low about themselves or not really confident, um, they have a tendency to start waning on face-offs. It's, it takes a lot of focus to win regular on face-offs. Now, they also, ever since they traded, and I've been trying to remember a while, Jay Beagle. Ever since they traded they Jay Beagle, they haven't been able to find a replacement for him either. But you can adjust to that with a certain game. And they did at one time. But this year, they didn't. Their overall possession game this year and their overall intensity for uh, getting the puck in the offensive zone especially, I thought was very light and waning this year. And it doesn't look like it's changing anytime soon. Yeah. No, they started, um, as we know, very good and then, balanced out to then allow the teams like us, the Flyers, to catch them. That's why the Capitals, realistically, with how they started the year, shouldn't have allowed us to be anywhere close to catching them by the pause. But because of what you said, they started having struggles. They started showing the inability to be consistent after about the first half, like right after the first half of the season. Um, That's when it started – balancing out and the Flyers started moving up the standings. Other teams started moving up the standings. And then the Eastern Conference was pretty close in the top three seedings by the time the whole thing was said and done because Washington was unable to actually play like their whole roster should have been able to play together. But And obviously a lot of that had to do with the fact that compared to in past systems he's been used in, in uh, Todd Reardon's uh, system, what's his name was not doing well. Braden Holpe. So, no. and so that's a, that's a big difference for the Capitals. A lot of times they were carried on some saves by Holpe in games they didn't play well, where this year they've been carried more by Sam Sonoff when he's been healthy, but he's not even an option for them right now if they want to go to him. And I don't think they're going to go to Vanacek in the playoffs. If, unless if Braden Holpe gives up eight goals, uh, I don't think – they're going to go to the Vanacek. Even even then, they might debate just saying, yeah, you're going back out there. Um, but other than that, he's going to have to have a putrid game. To, and it's not because they don't believe in the kid. It's because he's not a starter. They think he's going to be a backup at some point. So why would you throw him in a playoff starter? Uh, but, no, I think this is a, going to be a very fun battle game. We play Washington fairly well this year, but... I just think it's it's usually a very fun, very – usually these games are a little bit more chippy uh, as well, so you might be a little bit more battle-tested. I think after we the Flyers got going, too, we saw that they are playing to actually try to do stuff and improve and prove to their coach that they want to be on these lines because he, he knows, he says, we're going to keep seeing how things work. We might adjust stuff. So everyone's playing to stay with their pairing also. And everybody played like that in the first game. It's just a shame Raffle got injured because he played a hell of a game. But now it seems like Faraby will probably slot in and um, he can play that same similar role. It'll just be interesting to see what if he slots into that line or slots into an upper line. Yeah, I was really surprised Faraby what didn't make it uh, wasn't in there already to begin with. And this is where uh, AV has gotten criticism for not playing the young guys or whatever the case may be. Uh, I will side on AV side most times in anything he does, really. I just think he's a great coach, and there's I, I'm not in the room, so I don't really know exactly how everything's going on there. But uh, I, I'm, I'm glad Farabee's getting a chance. Not in these, not really didn't want it to be in this way, but uh, I'm, I'm excited to see how he does. And I think you bring up a very good point. Having depth in a round robin like this, can be not a good thing because you're sometimes not going to put your best roster out there. But a, with AV as a coach, it's turned out to be a very good thing because these guys are competing to play. So in a round robin, a lot of teams aren't going to put out the intensity that they normally would. And this, Philly likely is going to because at least from these players, because they're competing to play. So, and that, that permeates through the room. Right. And I really like, 
I don't know if it's a, what AB is saying in the room or whatever, but I get I I think that Philadelphia is in the same position as the Columbuses and Dallases of the world. They do have skill, but I wouldn't say they have the most top end skill compared to some other teams. They have more depth and they have good solid skill throughout their lineup. But in the end, I really think they're going to need to keep ramping up their intensity every game and being intense going into this, uh, uh, to the first round. I'm really wary of these teams that are not doing that. And there are teams that are not doing that. Do you think you're going to just turn it on against teams that have played with this uh, passion already playing in the play in round? I don't know. We'll see. I wouldn't want, I wouldn't want to bet on it. And I think Philadelphia has played with some pretty good intensity so far. No, I think they have too. And it's going to be very fun and very interesting to watch the Mars game and also to see if we do end up. Oh, 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 here we go. Elaine Vigneault has confirmed two hours ago um, that Brian Elliott will start tomorrow versus the Caps. We have a lot of trust and faith in both our goaltenders. Yeah. So Moose will be starting against the Capitals tomorrow. And as this one guy said, he did have a great season and played great against the Caps during the regular season. So we should all have faith in him. Um, yeah, I, I think we, I think we're going in good here, and I really like the way AV has made has did what he did with Elliot for Washington here again. Um, if there's any chance that they play Washington, I think they have a huge advantage, knowing that they're gonna. I think they're likely gonna beat him here, and then the next round is probably gonna be Carter Hart, and now they know they've lost twice against our our, our backup. And we'll be going against the Carter Hart team. Huge psychological advantage. I really like it. No, I, li- I like that they're giving Moose to start against Washington. Like I said, he looked very good against them. But that route wraps us up. Thanks so much for joining us on this edition of the Grittiest Take Playoff Edition. Pirlo, uh, if you have any of your handles you want to give to anybody, I'll let you uh, do that right now. Oh, we have. Uh, I'm uh, with BPAL Picks. Uh, that's a Patreon and, uh, per- and a YouTube channel. Uh, Patreon is an app. You can pick it up. I have clients that pay me to uh, help them betting, and we just have fun. Some of them just like to be on there and have fun with gambling. Uh, some of them are don't even care about hockey, and they just want to make money. So you can go on there. Uh, if we have three packages, you can look at and check out. Also, I have my NHL Pearls of Wisdom, which I just changed my whole platform for that. And my number, my my, uh, I'm getting the group back again. So come on over and join us and uh, have fun and frolic there. We love talking in the comment section and um, it's growing and it's fun. And of course, I'm always working with Joe whenever I can uh, with these Philadelphia Flyer podcasts. I love being able to put my energy now towards a team. I've been for a long time just talking about every team in the NHL and now I'm being a Philadelphia Flyer fan again, and I love it. So uh, all these podcasts I do with them. I'd like to also say Steel Flyers has just put out a web uh, a web page right now. He um, is fantastic. Him and his wife do podcasts together. I love them. They're a wonderful combination. And the stuff we do together with them is uh, fantastic as well. I'd highly recommend you go check it out. Um, you'll enjoy it, I am sure. Thank you, Joe, for letting having me on here. And I'm sure we'll be doing plenty of it. Yeah, certainly. There's plenty more playoffs to go. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. You can find our podcast at True underscore Philly Sport on Twitter and True Philadelphian Sports Care, spelled out on Insta and Tumblr, and me at JJBorer26 on Twitter. Have a pleasant and good day. Enjoy all the hockey, everybody. This has been the grittiest take flyers and capitals preview, as well as overall playoff edition. Peace out, everybody. Mm-hmm.